morning, everyone. I will start with a story. Slovakia, High Tatras, the sixth day of our mountain children camp, <laughs> and I'm one of the leaders. Tomorrow is our goal, and tomorrow is our the final day, and our goal is to reach the highest mountain shelter in Slovakia, in High Tatras, Rizmi, and it's over two kilometers height. I'm so excited about tomorrow, but I see that the kids are already tired after continuous walking, climbing, sleeping in tents, and all the rest in tents so tall experience. So I'm checking if everyone's asleep, and in one of the tents I find three girls not yet sleeping. They greet me with fear and hesitation. What if I get exhausted and tired on the top? What if I injure my leg there? What if I have an asthma attack? One girl is even crying. So we are talking it through and sharing feelings. And slowly, the girls keep losing their fear, and in the end, they get really confident about the climb tomorrow. So on the next day, we went out. And the girls were doing fabulously. Despite that it was getting colder, the wind was getting stronger, and it drizzled. Suddenly, we reached a place so steep that you have to hold on to chains in order to continue. And there, because of emergency, I have to go down to the valley. So I asked the girls, do you want to continue going up, and will you manage to go to the top where the rest of our group is already waiting? Not even a moment of hesitation, no doubt. They were completely confident about their success. And so we split. But when I came down to the valley, I got so nervous and worried. What was I thinking, letting three girls that I was responsible for to climb on their own? Fortunately, much sooner than I expected, three girls that feared the mountain just yesterday came down smiling and cheering, having reached their goal. I was overfilled with joy. It was amazing what a change they went through, and I was the part of it. After this moment, I was so sure that in my life, I want to feel this way more often. And that got me thinking, what could I do that would include spending more time with kids, helping them overcome problems, and witnessing change. I looked for answers in the program Renkwesi Mokiti, which translates, I choose to teach. It's a program that recruits the best graduates from universities, gives them educational training, and supports them to become great teachers in their first two years of work. I did exactly that. I tried my best to get kids engaged and excited about learning economics, and it was amazing. So now, I'm Renkosi Moki, the teacher for life. And here... <laughs> <laughs> here in this program, I met wonderful colleagues <laughs> who feel who feels exactly the same way about teaching. It is amazing. So, let us share with you our formula to understand better where this amazingness of being teacher comes from. And here you are the first we reveal this formula to, so you're welcome to apply it to your job and check if it's also as amazing as teaching. And the first argument in our formula is... Before the 1st of September, I imagine teaching like the train journey, traveling to the distant lands of thoughts, books and ideas, reading and writing stories and histories, sharing time and the worldviews with the like-minded. In September, I got two classes of teenagers, and soon realize that this is the different kind of the train, the roller coaster. 
From bell to bell, I was traveling at extreme speed, gasping for fresh air, screaming as the carriage plunged down into the void, and holding on to the snippets instead of stories. All October and November, I slept on average four hours a day, preparing schemes, treats, motivational tools, interactive tasks, giving elaborate feedback, and my pupils would be annoyed at best. I needed to stick to something, for I was devastated. Is there anything that works at all, or am I just the worst teacher ever? So, in December, I decided to go with all-round praise teamworking as the main strategy. And by the end of the month, parents of one of my classes insisted that kids would learn individually. But the other class carried on collaborating. So, on one frosty January morning, I got to the top of the ride. I looked around, admiring my pupils, all involved, excited, oozing with ideas and working as if nothing else existed. At that moment, I let the idea of the train journey go and embraced the challenge of an unpredictable roller coaster ride. Even learned to recognize and appreciate the rights of my pupils. This is not a happy ending. <laughs> there were many ups and downs since then, but whenever I hit the rock bottom now, I know that no matter what, I am at the fun fair. <laughs> If you're a teacher, your everyday is a roller coaster. You face challenges and you learn how to overcome mountains. And you teach your kids how to overcome theirs. And here comes the next argument in our formula. And this one won't sound surprising. <laughs> and because when it comes to facing challenges, you are never exactly on your own. Okay, I would like to tell you a story about Petros and Jonas, who I met around two years ago when I was starting to work at a new school, and I became their class head teacher. Two years ago was also the time when Petros and Jonas were the usual subjects of school staff meetings. Um, they were barely attending classes. If attending, then usually misbehaving and really impeding the learning process. Uh, they were rude and failing most of the subjects. And then comes me, the new class teacher. So I'm thinking the situation is wrong, so I must do something because I'm the new guy. I must solve problems. I didn't know what to do, though, so I thought of asking the kids. So I went to Petros one day and asked him a question. Well, Petros, do you feel happy at school? He looked at me and said, whatever. So I tried a different question. I, 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 I asked um, Petros, well, do you like attending any of your classes? Whatever, man. And it seemed as if every single question of mine was answered by this word, whatever. So I thought of being strict and giving him a 10-minute lecture of why it's important to engage in conversations and how adults always do that. And adults are successful. Well, they should be. Uh, but surprisingly, even to myself at that time, I agreed to his terms and said, OK, I understand you don't want to speak right now. That's quite unfortunate, because I really want to understand your experience at school. I fear it's not a very good one right now. So we'll meet again next week. And for that meeting, I'm asking you to think of what you do and don't like at school. And we'll continue our conversation from there. So we did meet after a week. And our conversation went, went a little bit better that time. And we've decided to meet yet again, and then yet again and again. So uh, this whole process of us meeting uh, took six months, so half a year of continuous conversations. No quick fixes, no magic recipes, um, just us talking, listening, understanding, reaching agreements, sometimes breaking them, but then again trying to fix them. And during this process, we've built a very strong relationship. We can carry on, build on it now. I trust them and they trust me. And now Petrus and Jonas are attending all classes. They're learning at the same pace as others. They're swearing much less than before, and they're socializing well within their class. And if not, we're just trying to speak about that. 
So this relationship might be among the strongest one I have at school, but it's not the only one. Because being a teacher requires me to care, to relate, and to respect. And that's exactly what I do. And it feels good. <laughs> if you're a teacher, you relate face to face, not face to Facebook. <laughs> yeah. You get related. <laughs> you get related. You hear kids' stories, their backgrounds, their choice and their problems, and you notice their emotions by the second. And this is real. So now, coming to the next one, and this one might sound surprising to you. Yes, because we're going to be comparing teaching to business for a short while, and we'll compare it in terms of marketing. Uh, so we have a product that we absolutely love, and we are sure that if it's consumed in large amounts, it's going to make the world a better place. So my product is mathematics. Uh, the language of logic in which you can prove something to be true and it's going to stay true for eternity. Uh, so I want to market my product. And if I use some conventional ways to market my product, perhaps I could do something like 15-second TV ads. Go on a screen and say, hey, do you feel that the world is a difficult to understand place? Do you feel that the squiggles in your bank account don't make much sense? Well, there's a cure for that. It's called mathematics. <laughs> or I could... Yeah, I, I could do phone marketing, call a person and say, hey, you've just won a 20% discount on this amazing book, Abstract Differential Geometry. How amazing is that? Uh, I, I mean, I could do banners on the streets, banners on websites. I could do door-to-door -door marketing. But just think for a second of how much better teaching is. I come every day to class, and people are already waiting there. <laughs> And these are, by the way, these are not just any random people off the street I have to hugely impress before they even start listening to me. These are people I know names of, I know their faces, I know their stories, I care about them. So there's no really need to hurry, there's no need to advertise my product for what it's not. And for simplicity's sake, let's imagine our product is a shoe. So it's class time, we have the people sitting, at their desks, and we take the shoe and say, hey, this week we're going to look at how amazing the laces are. <laughs> Today in particular, we're going to appreciate the tips of the laces because they are just great. But wait for it, next year, we're going to look at the materials the sole is made from, and it really makes the shoe outstanding. So the depth that you can go into your product is just far more reaching giving teaching as your marketing method uh, in comparison with any other advertising tool you can think of. So that's what I do every day. I share my passion of mathematics with people I care about. And I'm even paid to do that. And that's really what makes my waking up in the morning and going to work a happy routine. If you're a teacher, every day your clients are waiting to hear about your product. You have time, at least 45 minutes, to give them the best way of discovering how interesting, important, and joyful learning is. You have time to share your passion and get to see kids' shiny eyes. So, our formula is nearly finished. Let's come back to what I've started with. I unlock the classroom, let the kids in, and prepare for the lesson while chatting away with teenagers about their stuff. First bell. Ninth graders find their seats and succumb to the idea that the lesson is about to start. Second bell. I pull up a slide and officially greet the class when the door suddenly gets wide open and Lucas comes in, shouting out some commercial slogans, giving high five to his classmates, and even making a little dance routine. I politely greet him and invite to join the lesson that has already begun. Yeah, yeah, teacher, I get in reply. Well, it takes him five minutes to sit down and not prepare for the lesson. No exercise book, 
no homework, not even a pencil, his school bag still on his shoulders. Oh, dear it, runs through my head, and whenever I get the chance, I start the lesson. For I know my chances are slim. Lucas is not the kind of guy who lets anyone else, else run the show, especially the one containing some studying material. Well, he's not the guy who lets you to ignore him easily either. I ask him to stay after the lesson. Many previous attempts to arrive to some mutual understanding were in vain, so this time I had no clue what I am going to say when a thought suddenly crossed my mind and I just sped out. Lucas, you have an amazing performance talent. Why don't you come and get a part in an upcoming show that I'm raging with other kids? His answer was brief and surprising. Fine with me, he said. What do you want me to do? And so he came. He's one of the best attending pupils ever since. He played lead character in a couple of the school performances and even co-scripted one of them. The whole school community was in awe and showered Lucas with compliments and recognition, but the cherry on the top was put just a couple weeks ago when he told me that he enrolled in an acting class in the city. It's not just flowers and butterflies when it comes to Lucas, but looking at the journey he made in these last six months, I feel humbled. If you're a teacher, you witness change. Change in your kids and in yourself as well. Some changes come as fast as at that time with three girls in the High Tatras. But sometimes you start changes, even you may not get to see the results. Tada! Our formula is here. <laughs> so now you see all arguments are revealed. And doesn't this formula look amazing to you? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, it gets even better. What if all these arguments together we raise to the power of the future? <laughs> <laughs> because if you're a teacher, the moves you make today are the moves that live tomorrow. You have the future sitting in your class. That's why we have no doubt about our job being meaningful. So, become a teacher once in a while, spend some quality time with kids, volunteer in summer camps, or take part in your local school projects, and then, one by one, these arguments will greet you. But be careful with this power of the future. It will embrace you for life. Thank you. Thank you.